I will start. Yes. Evet, Ersin Hocam. Dear all, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the seventh CSOC seminar this term. As you know, this term, we have dedicated our seminar series to the discussions on the quality of democracy in Southeast Europe. Tonight, we are turning the limelight upon Turkey. The title of tonight's seminar is Turkey's New Constitution, the President's Monopoly over State Power and the Shrinking Role of the Parliament and Judiciary. I believe the title is quite self-explanatory. Together with our speakers, we will focus on Turkey's 2017 constitutional changes that has put in place a peculiar presidential system. We will examine how the system has been functioning over the last three years. We are so fortunate to have three very distinguished speakers with us tonight. Professors Bertil Emrehoder, Ersin Kalaycoğlu, and Murant Sevinç. They have very kindly accepted our invitation. We are so grateful to them. Before I turn the floor to our speakers, please allow me to remind you a few housekeeping points. We will have a Q&A session, a questions and answers session after the talk. If you want to address any question to any speaker, I would kindly ask you to write it into the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen. I would also be grateful if you could also state whether you would like to ask your question in person. If you expressed a preference to ask your question personally, to the extent possible, I will try to yield the floor to you and our Zoom expert administrator, Julie, will unmute you so that you can ask your question in person. Tamam, ben Zoom'da bir iki saat sonra ancak konuşabilirim. Tamam, görüşmek üzere. Without further ado, I would now like to turn the floor to our distinguished speakers. We will first start with Professor Bertil Emre Hoder. Professor Hoder is one of the leading constitutional law scholars in Turkey. She is the Dean of Koç University Faculty of Law, one of the best law faculties right now in Turkey. Her research focuses on comparative constitutional law, European Union law, and international human rights law. She's a full member of the Turkish Science Academy and has published numerous books and articles on constitutional law. And on a personal note for me, when I was an undergraduate law student at the University of Galatasaray, Professor Oder taught our human rights law classes. We all still remember very lively how inspirational, inspirational those lectures have been in our careers and in our academic and intellectual development. Therefore, it's a great personal honor for me to share the same panel with her. Professor Oder's speech will focus on the role that the courts, and especially the constitutional court, Turkish constitutional court, plays in checking and balancing the powers of the president. She will examine the impact of the current system upon the separation of powers and the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms. Professor Oder, you have the floor. Thank you so much. It is an immense pleasure to be a part of this significant seminar series. I extend my warm regards to all participants from Istanbul. I would like to share my sincere thanks to Southeast European Studies at Oxford, particularly my colleagues Oton Anastasakis, Mehmet Karlı, and Julie Adams for their very kind invitation, giving me the opportunity to talk about the challenges of the constitutional judiciary in Turkey. Under Turkey's uh, democratic uh, breakdown, Turkish Constitutional Court uh, offers actually a case study to identify the dynamics of judicial politics and constitutional review in electoral autocracies. Uh, this case study of Turkey may also contribute to the comparative scholarship on the role of courts under new pressures of the third wave autocratization, that contraction and expansion dynamics of the judiciaries uh, can be better understood. Uh, as you know, the third wave of autocratization is identified as a gradual uh, setback uh, of democracies or democratic qualities 
under a legal uh, disguise, and it is valid for entrenched and electoral democracies, uh, its impact actually on unconsolidated autocracies has been also remarkable that autocratic uh, consolidation may end up uh, with an increase of unmodified and uh, closed autocracies. In general, incremental democratic erosion uh, with the rise of autocratization has become a featuring phenomenon with a decisive impact on different constitutional jurisdictions and constitutionalism. And it has been also argued that autocratic constitutionalism can be an uh, intermediate uh, normative model between liberal democratic constitutionalism and authoritarian constitution constitutionalism. Under the current uh, democratic uh, decline, the media uh, and uh, the freedom of civil society and to a significant extent, uh, the rule of law are severely attacked areas. In contrast uh, with the closed autocracies or traditional authoritarianism, the severe violation of uh, human rights such as ill treatment, forced disappearances or torture are not at the forefront. According to BDAM Institute Annual Democracy Report 2020, autocracies are in the majority in 92 countries that make approximately 54% uh, of the global population for the first time since 2001. Turkey was classified as an electoral uh, democracy that furthered her democratic consolidation under the Europeanization process between 2001 and 2013. Now Turkey has been marked as a category of democratic breakdown uh, according to the recent findings of the VDAM uh, Institute. And she has been uh, represented an incremental constitutional decline since 2013, namely uh, the year park of Gezi Park protests against uh, the government. The regressions as regards free media, civic space, the rule of law, and of course, the horizontal constraints on the executive power have increased since uh, then. As to the main components uh, of electoral democracy index, Turkey's score has decreased uh, over the past 10 years at a very uh, significant uh, level, particularly uh, regarding the freedom of expression and the clean uh, elections. Against uh, this backdrop, I would like to feature the judicial politics of the Turkish Constitutional Court under Turkey's current democratic regression by conceptualizing a resistance deference paradox on the ground of politically significant uh, cases. Here, I would like to remind that 15 out of 15 constitutional judges are appointed by AK Party, the ruling party affiliated state uh, presidents or parliamentary majority of the AK Party or its uh, supporters. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the Turkish Constitutional Court does not represent uh, the characteristics of a typical uh, subservient court, that its judicial behavior deserves attention to understand the role of judiciary under electoral autocracies. After 2010 amendments that actually uh, reshuffled the constitutional court and the uh, council of the judges and the uh, prosecutors there is no doubt the uh, constitutional court has mostly com uh, complied with AK party's preferences at the expense of uh, uh, changing its uh, well-established uh, approach and in this respect the court has already uh, reverse its, op its own active and very strong stance based on the purposive interpretation in crucial cases uh, of the expansion of executive power and uh, particularly regarding the pitfalls of the emergency decrease. Nonetheless, the abstract norm review seems to play still a crucial role for providing horizontal accountability in some core issues of autocratic policies. The fact that court has been quickly demonized by the ruling elite in uh, politically significant cases uh, can be deemed as an evidence of this partly effective judicial control under autocratic uh, pressure. Recently, the Minister of Interior has attacked the court directly on the ground that the court has nullified two significant uh, statutory rules, namely the ban 
on uh, demonstrations on expressways and the imposition of security investigations for public servants. Later, the minister's uh, furious criticism has been supported by the nationalist ally of the government calling constitutional amendments for a subservient constitutional court. Here I can also refer to the ongoing debate on President Erdogan's recent call for a new constitution. Uh, the government's ally, the nationalist uh, movement party underscores uh, the current constitution is the product of extraordinary circumstances and it still embeds the non-democratic tutelage institutions such as the constitutional court. Uh, receiving the backlash of the of, of those auto, uh, autocratic actors, uh, the individual application procedure uh, adopted in uh, 2010 constitutional amendments as a supportive mechanism for human rights protection uh, threatens actually the stability of autocratization by creating uncertainty for the regime. Uh, the constitutional court comes to the focus uh, as a power broker and a popular agent through the individual application case of despite the autocratic pressure the individual application has still the potential to serve like a structural uh, arrangement that increases uh, in independency of the constitutional court and it also provides a judicial support uh, network strikingly uh, the individual application has resulted a shift of power from the government to the constitutional court as observed actually in many other jurisdictions of judicial expansion and such uh, such a shift of power is also valid from the lower or other apex courts to the constitutional court the recent statistics show that approximately 93 percent of the admissible applications uh, as regards the individual application procedure are resulted in favor of claimants to redress the violation of constitutional uh, rights. Uh, despite uh, the popularity of individual application and judicial expansion on the basis of human rights litigation, uh, the court's uh, response to the autocracy is truly unstable and inconsistent. There is a resistant deference paradox in its comparable case law on the similar issues that actually have a significant uh, public impact because of their political magnitude. In uh, all of those cases, the core interests of the regime are at stake in a comparable context, but claimants are treated differently. And this paradox causes the criticism uh, of the regime opponents since uh, such an unreliable judicial responsiveness does not meet uh, the expectations. Here I focus at first on a cluster of cases regarding journalists and human rights defenders. Actually, uh, these may be also classified uh, as the archetypes uh, for assessing the court's judicial behavior under the rising tide of autocracy. The independent journalism and uh, free society represent the leading areas that are under attack uh, of Turkey's democratic breakdown uh, as observed by the Liberal Democracy Index and Electoral uh, Democracy Index. And Turkey has been uh, marked as a country which has the highest uh, number of imprisoned journalists of the Council of Europe member states. Uh, and uh, recently I have checked uh, the platform uh, for protection of uh, journalists it is a journalism at risk uh, platform developed by Council of Europe and uh, still Turkey is the leading uh, country as regards uh, the journalists uh, in uh, detention. Uh, and recently the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe uh, has uh, also uh, underlined uh, that the abuse of the criminal code and particularly the anti-terrorism laws against journalists uh, are, that are held in uh, arbitrary pretrial arrest and detention uh, for months, sometimes for years uh, before their cases come uh, to the uh, court. Referring to the major uh, journalism case of Turkey, uh, I can remind uh, Jumuriyet uh, trials, including a large group of journalists. Uh, I can also emphasize Altan brothers, uh, Alpay and Olajak. Uh, when we look at all those cases, we can clearly observe the resistance difference paradox of the court applied in a very selective uh, manner. 
uh, Cumhuriyet journalists have been collectively tried in a marathon of intensive hearings with the same or similar allegations, uh, particularly assisting terrorism without being a member of a terrorist organization, but they are treated, uh, they are not uh, treated equally by the constitutional court uh, in terms of uh, long pretrial uh, detentions. Uh, the court has not responded more than a year to the applications of journalists, although it applies the chilling effect doctrine to the journalism cases as a matter of uh, principle. When we look at, uh, for example, Mehmet Altan and Shahin Altan uh, cases, these are resulted by the court in a journalism friendly manner, but the uh, belated uh, response has been again a serious issue. And in addition, Al Ahmed Altan's case has not been reviewed by the court on the same uh, day that his brother Mehmet Altan's case has been decided, although they are subject to the same uh, allegations in the same uh, criminal uh, trial. As to the civic space, uh, I can remind the Academics for Peace uh, case that involves thousands of progressive academics who have signed a petition criticizing the government's anti-terrorism policies in southeastern cities of Turkey and removed from their offices due to their uh, signatures. In this case, the Constitutional Court has defended the freedom of expression of the academics in a broad manner and it has become the, uh, the owner of the constitutional democracy. Nonetheless, uh, in the emblematic and cafes case of Osman Kavala, who was accused of financing Gezi Park demonstrations to overthrow the government, the court has been truly submissive and it acted as a part of autocratic uh, coalition. The second cluster that may be relevant that we can test this uh, resistance uh, deference paradox uh, could be the case law regarding the executive power as a matter of constitutional division of powers under the new presidential system. In its recent case law on presidential decrees, the court establishes the horizontal accountability of a strong executive by using uh, a rather careful resistance deference strategy. In this strategy, uh, there is a limitation to be imposed on presidential decrees but in a very delicate manner that some reserved areas of political question doctrine is uh, provided. The resistant difference uh, paradox of the constitutional court refers to an inherent inconsistency, but it still creates an uncertainty for autocratic legalism by both moderating and destabilizing it. As a moderator, it has served to the horizontal accountability by limiting the executive power in the case of one presidential decrees as destabilizing in fact, uh, uh, we can also uh, refer again to the journalism uh, cases that have been actually challenged by the lower judiciary, uh, or we can also make a reference to the academic for peace endorsing the freedom of expression on politically sensitive uh, issues. Uh, through such a resistant uh, pattern uh, or through such a resistant judici judicialization in the leading cases of political repression involving dissents, the constitutional court remains uh, as, as a space of contestation. Uh, the judicial review seems to be used by the constitutional court as a pressure wall to meet the minimum expectations of the European support supervision uh, for being uh, an effective remedy as observed in Shahin Altan and Mehmet Altan cases. And this may be also equally or partly valid uh, for, uh, for some of the journalists of the uh, Jumuriyet uh, trials. However, the European Court of Human Rights uh, case law does not provide an external legitimization in all significant cases of political repression. Judicializing the autocratic legality, the court could support the op oppressive practices and the misuse of criminal uh, investigations. As an emblematic case of dissuasive effect on the civic society decided by the European Court of Human Rights, Kavala shows the limited impact of the European supervision for the court regarding uh, the presumed enemies uh, of the uh, regime. All in all, uh, uh, by using uh, such a uh, resistance deference, deference uh, paradox, uh, the court has helped to uh, le legitimize uh, and uh, mask uh, actually the autocrat autocratization uh, in uh, Turkey. 
Uh, all in all, uh, the resistance deterrence paradox employed, uh, employed by the court uh, leads to the compliance uh, legitimization advantages and the contestation desitabilization uh, disadvantages for the populist autocracy. Recent criticisms of the ruling elite uh, against the court and the threats of purge uh, can be explained by the tension uh, embedded in this complexity associated with the role of constitutional judiciary in electoral autocracies. This reveals, of course, the fragility of the court, depending on the constellation of the political forces. Uh, the uh, deference resistance strategy is not a sustainable judicial politics in long run. Uh, it would not be wrong to predict that the court will be tailored as the faithful servant of the regime if the President Erdogan's call for a new constitution is put in concrete terms. I thank you very much uh, for your interest and patience. Bertil Hocam, thank you very much. Uh, just a word, you know, just for the Q&A section, your microphone might be touching your jumper every now and then it creates a hushing noise. Uh, I mean, uh, perhaps, you know, just you can hold it like this, I don't know, during the Q&A session, but thank you very much, you know, just for this wonderful presentation. Now, uh, we, will we will now turn to Professor uh, Ersin Kalajoğlu. For those of you who follow Turkish studies in any way, Professor Kalajoğlu needs no introduction. He's uh, one of the doyens of political science in Turkey. Uh, he's currently a professor of political science at Sabancı University. He previously taught at Istanbul and Boğaziçi universities and served as director, that is the president of Işık University. Professor Kalajoğlu held a visiting scholarship, a visiting professorship at our own very St. Anthony's College in 2000-2001. He, he was widely published on various aspects of Turkish politics. Tonight, Professor Kalajoğlu will help us answer a fundamental question, which is, what is Turkey's present constitutional system? And what has been the impact of the new constitution, as it were, upon parliamentary politics in Turkey. Professor Kalajoğlu, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I would like to again uh, go through the motions of thanking um, Mehmet Karle, uh, Otton Anastasakis and Julie Adams for uh, the kind of job they've done. Uh, that is the Turkish way. You know, if I were American, I would crack a jo joke of some kind. If I were German, I would have a very long definition, a paragraph long or something. If I were Japanese, I would have apologized elaborately. But as a Turk, we start with a thank you note. Um, I hope you'll understand. And then um, look into this process that um, uh, Bertil Oder actually helped me lay down. First of all, I would like to mention to you that we don't have a brand new constitution. This constitution was established in 1982 and it established um, a sort of a um, semi-parliamentary regime, uh, a regime in which the president's office was put in charge of security defense and foreign policy issues with a national security council, which is not as effective now. And uh, a, it was also, based on the notion that um, uh, in the 1980s, Turkey was at some kind of undeclared war with the Soviet Union. There was a socialist Marxist and challenge. And the best way to cope with that was to have a political Islamist and ethnic Turkish nationalist, uh, what was called then Turkish Islamic synthesis as an ideology and people motivated by that ideology to confront them. And the 1982 constitution was a product of this kind of thinking. And also uh, the military junta that actually wrote the constitution had very little trust in the elected politicians. These were small town politicians who were ready to compromise any kind of value in Turkey. So they shouldn't be given much of a role in determining uh, the um, major concerns of the country pertaining to uh, security, um, defense and also foreign policy. 
So that would be a realm relegated to the office of the, of the president. And this president was, of course, not popularly elected at the time, uh, elected by the Turkish Grand National Assembly, uh, and was not neither politically nor legally responsible for any of the decisions the president had made, um, especially uh, the ex officio decisions. Now this uh, sort of a set a standard, but from 2000s onwards, uh, in 2007, 2010, 2017, there were three major changes in the constitution, all supported by um, popular vote. Although in 2017, we are not so sure whether the popular vote actually was, a, was in support or not, uh, but um, it carried through uh, under the circumstances of the day, which was not necessarily an election that was held in a democratic environment. It was conducted under emergency measures and the um, no camp uh, could not be very vocal under those circumstances. Uh, in spite of the fact um, the, the government um, had to sort of uh, pressure the, uh, the Supreme Board of Elections at the last minute to accept some irregularities in the ballots uh, for, for, for them to carry through uh, the changes in the constitution. And um, so that was a fait accompli, which was also mentioned by the president that very night. Uh, so the legitimacy of the last uh, referendum in 2017, which established the current regime in its current shape, uh, has been questioned by the opposition ever since. I don't believe the opposition, especially the Republican People's Party, ever accepted uh, the results of the constitution, constitutional amendment uh, in 2017. Ersin Hocam, uh, we may have lost Professor Kalaycıoğlu. I mean, we, I, I believe in him just he's having a problem with his internet connection. Uh, you hear me, right? Hocam, evet. Okay, you hear me. Um, let me see. Uh, I'll try to reach out to Professor Kalaycıoğlu so that we can figure out what... Um. Uh, th that outcome um, has been in the making for a while. As I mentioned in 2007, there was another ref a referendum made which changed the status of the regime from uh, semi-parliamentary to semi-presidential, uh, just like the um, French Fifth Republic with an elected president, elected legislature from which the government uh, of the prime minister and prime minister's cabinet or prime minister's council of ministers emerged and were responsible to it. Now, this was practiced very briefly for about 10 years. Uh, the first uh, seven years was still the ancien regime of the previous semi-parliamentarism under President Gül. And then in 2014, Erdogan was elected as the president of the country for the first time. And therefore, uh, we had both the jure and de facto semi-presidentialism. Then in 2017, the regime changed again and we moved away from um, semi-presidentialism with the 2017 uh, referendum that I talked about to a form of presidentialism. But this presidentialism is um, rather specific um, in its uh, uh, organization and I'll try to define it to you and then I pass a judgment on what it looks like uh, in the end. First of all, uh, since its practice from July 2018 up until now, we observe that the line between the current regime and the state or the government and the state is pretty much blurred. In fact, Turkey does not have an executive branch of the government. The, uh, article of the constitution says the executive power and function shall be exercised and carried out by the president of the republic in conformity with the constitution and laws. How far that in conformity uh, with the constitution and laws is a matter of debate. But the definition here is that we have one executive, the president, that is it. 
We don't have an executive branch defined uh, elaborately uh, in Article 8. And then um, this also emphasizes uh, that the um, president's personality plays the most important role in the politics of the country, uh, dominating the management style of the government completely. So from 2018 onwards, it's a form of personalism in power. In fact, various articles were amended in this 2017 referendum uh, to bolster this. The executive power shall be vested in the president of the republic, it says. One individual. All executive power is vested in this individual, according to Article 104. And then the president of the republic in his or her capacity is the head of state. So both head of government and head of state. He or she shall appoint and dismiss the high-ranking executive, so has huge amount of administrative duties and capabilities uh, of a you know undefined uh, high-ranking executives. Who are they? How do we know? Anyway, um, the president will sort it out probably. And then he or she shall ratify and promulgate international treaties. So the president ratifies international treaties now. And then he, she shall determine national security policies and take necessary measures. No longer the Security Council that I talked about in the original form of the 1982 Constitution, it's the president. There is a National Security Council, but it's relegated to a marginal position now under these circumstances. So leaving ultimately all major political decisions to the discretion of one person, personal discretion of the leader or president who is also um, the leader of a political party. Therefore, he has three hats, party leadership, head of government, head of state. And he can uh, fiddle those uh, three hats properly and he cannot serve in all those three roles effectively. And he doesn't. In fact, his leadership as the head of state is the one that is neglected the most. He is not involved in any kind of uh, sort of inclusivity of his style of rule. In fact, he is just the opposite, creating as much rift between his government and the government parties of the opposition um, at the same time, uh, try to create as big a um, sort of uh, divide between the government and the uh, opposition as possible. Therefore, it leaves little room for him to function as the um, head of state, the president who has um, leading or who has been leading as a leader, creating inclusivity for all citizens of the country uh, as such. That is probably not intended anyway. But the system has a huge absence of institutions, which are not emphasized in the constitution very much, and also operates in the absence of valuable deliberation and negotiations. The formation of a management style without political institutions has developed. In fact, the public bureaucracy has become marginalized and uh, non-authorized as all kinds of political professional decisions are put into effect by asking the superiors, by the uh, bureaucrats in the ministries, obtaining the, the approval of the superiors all the way to the president's office before um, making a decision formal. So in decision-making processes, time was prolonged, decisions are frequently disrupted, renewed, and decision-making uncertainty has increased tremendously. An administration that does not comply with rules, laws, and constitution has started to emerge. So in the implementation of the constitution, laws, and statutes, there has been inequality, a case-by-case -case treatment, and a considerable amount of favoritism for certain groups and communities, especially on the on partisan basis, and cronies of those who are close to the um, to the government. And Turkey now experiences a, a, a legal regime which may be best described as constitutional hypocrisy. There is a written constitution, but that constitution does not bind the government. The government can act as if the, Turkey has no constitution. So the best way to refer to it is a situation of constitutional hypocrisy. Thirdly, uh, we have um, deliberation and discussion 
of issues have been increasingly prevented so that the opposition is not given much of a uh, chance to voice their um, complaints or uh, their uh, contestations. It became clear that uh, those decisions that are being made without the impact of the opposition does not necessarily give them uh, any chance of being embedded in, uh, in facts, in science, and also in uh, empirical reality. So post-truth has set in, which results in many decisions which have inconsistencies, a lot of U-turns and zigzags being made. For example, according to a study by a constitutional lawyer in 2020, there were 55 presidential decrees between July 2018 and December 2019, 31 of the 55 had been decrees issued to correct the previously issued 24 decrees. So there were only 24 decrees, but their numbers increased to 55 because they had to be corrected. One and a half decrees per decree. So that shows you the kind of uh, messy decision-making process that we found ourselves in. And combined with uh, with economic uncertainty, unpredictability, and irregularity under these circumstances, um, especially in the area of macroeconomics. Transaction costs for the corporations of the country have increased tremendously, especially uh, when economic decision-making and implementation are in such a limbo. Uh, the investment environment has, has been seriously affected and investments have decreased in the system. Uh, and we have now a distorted form of capitalism uh, in, in place. In the end, political, economic, and social turmoil, irregularities, illegal practices, and a lot of corruption have become widespread in the polity. So if you look at this picture and pass a judgment on this, first of all, it looks like a highly um, absolutist system, highly personalistic. Uh, in which um, legal rational thinking seems to be sidelined. So it, it can be traditional, not necessarily modern, but it looks like modern. It, we, we have the facades of these various uh, laws, constitutions, uh, and institutions, or institutional -like looking organizations. Therefore, I'm tempted to call it a neo patrimonial style of rule, uh, which operates in the form of sultanism as. Hushang Shehabi and Juan Linz's um, edited volume, Sultanistic Regimes, called such regimes. And in the Turkish case, uh, this is not the first time this appeared. 100 years ago, Abdelhamid II has something similar. So I've been calling this regime a form of neo Hamidianism. So we are sort of repeating the same historical trend um, for a second time, 100 years after uh, that collapse. Now, in this environment, of course, the Grand National Assembly also went through a considerable amount of change. First of all, its number of seats increased from 550 to 600. Secondly, elect, age of elect, electability. Um, the uh, deputies of the Grand National Assembly can now be elected at the age of 18 before they uh, graduate from college or university. So this is quite something. But if you look at the record from 1999 up until now, 1999, the average age uh, in the Grand National Assembly was 49.9, years. In 2002, when Justice and Development Party was elected for the first time, it was 48.3 years. Um, now it is 49.3 years. So it's grown older. So it doesn't look as if um, many more younger people uh, were introduced. However, this is not necessarily a sign to bring the youth in to Turkish politics and play some major role. This shows the relative irrelevance of the Grand National Assembly, where even youth without much knowledge about politics can play some role, number one. Number two, youth are more impressionable. And therefore, under these circumstances, uh, it will be easier for the youth uh, to act like foot soldiers of the Justice and Development Party under the leadership uh, of the awesome leader, uh, Erdogan himself. So uh, that also gives an indication how the Grand National Assembly is viewed uh, under these circumstances. And 
There is now simultaneous election of both the president and the Turkish Grand National Assembly, uh, defined in Article 77 and 116, um, so that there won't be any risk, risk of or risk be minimized that the president would be from one party and the majority of the Grand National Assembly from the opposition, although this is not impossible. Now, the majority of the Grand National Assembly is in the hands of a coalition, not the Justice and Development Party, which was a main reason why we wanted to have presidentialism because we were sick and tired of coalition politics. Now we are again ruled by a coalition in the Grand National Assembly, uh, but without the coalition, of course, the majority would go into the hands of the opposition. And under those circumstances, they may have laws uh, which cannot be controlled by the president's office any longer. And that might probably create a big, big struggle between the president as the executive and the majority in the Grand National Assembly. We have just the opposite now, where the president's shadow is heavily uh, reflected on the uh, Grand National Assembly and its lawmaking process, and also uh, its uh, debilitation of um, uh, control. In fact, according to Faik Östrak, the spokesperson for the Republican People's Party, in the 21st Assembly, um, way back in the 1990s, 87% of the written questions uh, deposited by the opposition were answered by the ministers, 87%, close to 90%. Now in the 27th assembly, currently, this rate was dropped to only 6%, from 90%, close to 90%, 87% to 6%. That is how small the ability of control uh, of the Grand National Assembly that is. I can give you uh, further examples, but I'll continue. And this is now a legislature that has very little ability uh, to uh, hold the executive accountable, except under extraordinary circumstances. Theoretically, the president can be impeached, but you need two thirds majority to do that. And it's virtually impossible. There have been times where political parties had that kind of majority in the Grand National Assembly, but it's absolutely rare. So. The Grand National Assembly has turned into something like a grand public notary, a rubber stamp legislature, very submissive, um, working on the legislation presented to it by the president's office and often um, through the back door, uh, which looked like the proposal of a deputy, but it actually is not. It's brought down by the president's office uh, and then uh, acted upon according to president's orders. And in fact, in last week, the president had a way of arguing about the Grand National Assembly on these HDP uh, situation. Um, the, uh, the decision on the fate of some of the uh, Kurdish nationalist um, MPs, whether they'll be um, standing or not, um, uh, any, any, any longer will there be um, a vote, whether they can hold their seats uh, any longer or not, the president said that they'll raise their hands and it'll go through. Uh, he's not even a member of the Grand National Assembly, although he is the leader of the same political party. So he has his influence on the um, Grand National Assembly as such. Can the Grand National Assembly get out of this situation and, and reassert itself as, the, as a major institution for uh, Turkish Grand National Assembly, as some of you may know, was a very special institution. That was the, um, the institution that established the state that fought the war of liberation and that established the Turkish nation or, or the nation state in the end. So we had the Grand National Assembly when Turkey had nothing else. So this is the grand institution that turned into a rubber stand in the hands of these people who have moved uh, rapidly away from the center um, increasingly to the far right. And Turkey is now operating in a regime where the voters are also congregated uh, on the far right. Uh, and I'll um, show you what I mean if you ask questions on that. If that picture changes, and if the uh, Turkish voters again congregate more around the center of the left right spectrum, uh, somehow change their voting patterns away from the extreme right-wing AKP and uh, MHP, the two coalition uh, 
parties in a government in the Grand National Assembly and the president as the uh, leader of the Justice and Development Party um, and vote for political parties that want to go back to a form of democracy, then the chances are that we may have a Grand National Assembly that may have a greater stature in Turkish politics than the one we currently have. I'll stop here uh, and look for your, forward to your questions. Thank you very much. And sorry for the disruption. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's been an amazing presentation, especially you know, just your findings regarding the nature of the system, Sultanism, New Hamidianism, and actually it provides us a great, you know, just passing point to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Murat Sevinch. Professor Sevinch is a leading constitutional law and constitutional history scholar. Previously, he taught at Mülkiye, that is the Faculty of Political Science of the University of Ankara. He was ousted from the University of Ankara in 2017 with a statutory decree passed under the state of emergency as part of a wider purge that targeted democratic and critical academics. As those of you who know him would have expected such an illegitimate decision could not and did not stop him from continuing his intellectual production. And he has since then reaching out to a much larger audience with his articles uh, at the Dikan website in, and in other in just public places. And I'm personally sure that sometime in the near future, we will organize this type of events at Mülki again, and Professor Sevinch will again enrich the minds of his students as a faculty member. And those pseudo academics, I would say, who collaborated with the authorities to ask such names as Professor Sevinch will only make their way into the dustbin of history, for sure. And we do not need to you know, just remember their names. Professor, Professor Sevinch, as part of you know, just his contribution tonight, will evaluate Turkey's present constitutional system in the context of the history of Ottoman Turkish constitutions. And he will particularly focus on the status and powers of the head of state in the evolution of these constitutions. Professor, Professor Sevinch, you've got the floor. Uh, thank you very much, dear Mehmet and the other audiences. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, actually. And uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, does, uh, this is something the history of the, the, the presidency of Turkey, the head of state of Turkey uh, the, from uh, Ottoman time now. This, uh, the, of course, the very comprehensive uh, the subject, but I uh, try to summarize uh, as much as I can. And the, <clears throat> uh, of course, I uh, use my notes, uh, if you don't mind. I, I know it's a little bit boring, but thank you again. Uh, almost every article of the 1982 constitution has been a matter of debate since its adoption. The constitutional position uh, of the president has also been an issue in these discussions. The president's term of office, uh, his duties and powers and rules pertaining uh, <clears throat> to the presidential election have been on the agenda on varying occasions. Thus, one would suppose that there must be some uh, uh, logical reasons uh, for this unusual situation. In my opinion, it's not possible to tackle the current constitutional uh, the, the pr problems or troubles uh, issues without understanding both the political and uh, legal historical uh, background. Uh, the first constitution in Ottoman Turkish history was adopted in uh, 1876. In the year of 1876, the Abdulhamid uh, II was acting under pressure of the small group of reformers. For the first time in this day, for the first time, the Ottoman history, the document in question provided some constitutional mechanism to check the absolute power uh, of the Sultan. 
Sultan. Uh, but in this constitution, uh, the Sultan was the most powerful figure in the constitution in this time, and he was definitely stronger than the both uh, chambers in the parliament. The important amendments were made to this constitution in 1909, after the 1908 revolution declared the second constitutional monarchy, Ikinci Meşrutiyet, in Ottoman history. This marginally uh, more liberal era, which didn't last long, of course, and unfortunately, is referred to as the beginning of bourgeoisie revolution as well. The most important contribution of the set amendment were that uh, they laid the basic principles of the parliamentary system, which lasted for a century. Amendments in 1909 incorporated parliamentary qualities in the system abolished by this constitution, thereby holding minister accountable to the parliament and revoking the sultan's absolute veto power. Subsequent to said amendments, the most important institution was no longer the sultan, but the Mejlis Mebusan, Chamber of Deputies. Thus, the constitutional system finally uh, came into being the similar to the parliamentary monarchies of Western Europe. This tendency to parliamentarianism in the political system endured uh, with the exception of the period of the war of independence of Turkey during, the, during which there was a need for a conventional parliamentary system, or you can say the assembly, uh, the parliamentary system under the conditions of the day. This era of the national liberation was the most interesting and innovative period without any hesitation in Turkey's constitutional history. Uh, the important thing is uh, from 1909 to the last constitutional amendment, the parliament became the strongest and prestigious body of the constitutional system in our history, at least on the text. Uh, the second constitution, teşkilat Esasiye, uh, was adopted in 1921 the first, uh, by the first uh, TGNA, uh, Turkish Grand National Assembly. This was a very important and impressive constitution in Turkish history. The text is very short, included just only uh, 23 articles and the additional article uh, at the end the very short and special constitution of our history. Uh, the constitution proclaimed the principle of national sovereignty, thus the source of authority transformed from divinity to a secularist structure, and the constitution set up an conventional parliamentary government, or you can say the assembly government, as I said before, which was more convenient and functional for an era of revolution. The legislative and executive powers were vested in the assembly. The first article is very impressive. The sovereignty invested in the nation without condition or any restriction to this uh, constitution. Actually, that was uh, undoubtedly a republic, but for tactical political reasons, the TGNA didn't abolish the Sultanate until after final victory of war, at war. The Sultanate was abolished on October 1922. So there was not an office like the head of state in this short constitution uh, as a result of the conventional parliamentary system based on the unity of the legislative and the executive powers. Mustafa Kemal was the head of the TGNA and the head of the delegation of representatives, Heyeti uh, Temsiliye. He was a kind of uh, an unnamed president, actually. The Republic was officially proclaimed about two years later by the uh, constitutional amendments on uh, 29 October 1923. And Mustafa Kemal was elected at the first president. Uh, after this, the Turkish Republic clearly needed a new constitution. Finally, the first constitu constitution of the Republic was adopted in 1924, 
just after the proclamation of the Republic in October, the first Republican constitution advocated a hybrid system, which uh, consists of characteristics of both parliamentary and conventional uh, system. A uh, dual executive model possessed the characteristic of both the conventional and conventional government and parliamentary system in that the head of state is politically non-accountable and the council of minister is responsible to the parliament. The only body exercising the sovereignty, the parliament, was to exercise legislative power itself and executive power as challenged through the president and the council of minister. Uh, it, uh, though the constitution of 1924 delegated extremely limited powers to the president, the presidents could still be highly influential during uh, this period. But it should be noted that uh, what gave the rise to such influence was their historical eminence rather than the laws. If you look at the, the constitution, they have no too much power but in reality, reality in politics and reality in a society, the first president uh, of the Republic is Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and the second one is the, the Ismet Inönü and third one uh, after uh, 1950 is the Celal Bayar. You know, they were uh, the very uh, historical uh, personality and uh, that's why they, are so strong. they were so strong. As uh, Ergun Özbudun, uh, the, the, one of the, 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 the professor of uh, constitutional law in Turkey, er, uh, Ergun Özbudun, indicates both in the single party and the multi-party years, the authoritarian leadership of the chief executives and the strong party discipline reduced the assembly to a secondary role, but not uh, because of the constitution, as I said, uh, this, uh, the, the, because of the strong personalities. This future of the constitution caused internal turmoil during the single party years between 1924 and 1946, but the situation has changed suddenly after the establishment of the new political party. The DP, Democratic Party, was another political party which rose from the ranks of the bourgeoisie and founding fathers at the DP were part of the long-term ruling party uh, the DP was victorious in the impressive contention between uh, 46 and 50. Uh, this new era led to the emergence of debates on the constitution, the effects of which continue to prevail in the present day. The lack of constitutional checks and balance did not pose the major troubles during the single party system but the structural deficiencies of the constitution became obvious with the transition uh, to a multi-party system. Uh, thus, after the election uh, of 1954, the tension increased gradually between the DP and the opposing party uh, with uh, every passing year step by step. And finally, some units of the Turkish army named young officers, uh, forces overthrew the government on uh, May uh, 1960. This was the first military coup in Turkey. Uh, what is important for me? The question at this point becomes, what are the worst uh, repercussion of the DP period and the coup? in terms of ensuing developments in Turkey's political and constitutional history. In my opinion, DP's era left a terrible legacy for the right-wing parties. This was the concept of the majoritarian democracy. One of the main reasons behind the never-ending constitutional debates in Turkey is the legacy. One year later after the coup, uh, the uh, 1961 constitution was adopted and finally finally came into force after being ratified by popular vote on July 1961. That was the most democratic constitution uh, in Turkish constitutional history. 
it was brought its completely new and revolutionary provisions about the welfare state, about the uh, freedom of expression and association and the constitutional guarantees for political parties and judicial organs, uh, autonomous establishments, etc. That was the most democratic constitution of our history as the kind of summit, actually. Uh, this constitution took fundamental step, steps towards uh, parliamentarism, the system where the president still held a symbolic position. Furthermore, some fundamental amendments were introduced to ensure his or her impartiality. For instance, the president term of office will not overlap with the election period of the TGNA. And uh, it was stipulated that when elected, the president uh, shall sever his relations with uh, his or her political party and no longer serve uh, as an MP. Increasing political tension caused the military intervention on March 1971, once again, but this time it was not a coup, but it was harsh warming by the military. The memorandum of uh, 12th March, 1971. The new constitutional amendments were enacted in their uh, in the interim period in uh, 1971, between 1971 and 73, of this gentle military intervention that forced the government to resign and installed a technocratic uh, government. But one should underline that these amendments were a kind of rehearsal for the military coup in the year of 1980. Uh, at the end of the 70s, Turkish politics faced enormous social, political and economic crisis and the successive coalitions have avoided confrontation on the big issues. This led to uh, the increase in the sharp political and social polarization and the violence in the streets. This period was a time a large general strikes that were quite nerve wracking for the Turkish bourgeoisie as well. And the result was very familiar as you guessed, the military coup uh, in September uh, 1980 uh, and the end of the uh, 1971, or uh, sorry, uh, 61 uh, constitution. The new constitution had various provisions just in favor of authority for the first time in Turkey's constitutional history. The states were protected against its citizens and the employers were protected against the workers. Although the constitution retained the main principles of parliamentary system and the supremacy of parliament, presidential authority was overpowered. Uh, before the, the amendments of uh, 2017, uh, I would like to say just, uh, just a brief, uh, something brief. Uh, the framers of the 1982 constitution approached their tasks with the assumption that the political crisis of the 70s was due to the erosion state authority and more specifically to the weakness of the executive branch. The underlying objective of the framers, therefore, a strong state and a strong executive branch. Almost every single departure of the constitution from its predecessor can be construed in these terms. On one hand, the constitution, uh, 1982 constitution, like its uh, predecessor, seeks to ensure the political impartiality uh, of the presidency. It keeps, it keeps him politically unaccountable and it maintains at the office as the representative of the, Tur uh, of the Turkish Republic and the unity of the Turkish nation. But on the other hand, it transformed the, pre uh, the presidency from a symbolic and ceremonial office into active and powerful one with important political and appointive functions. But the system of government remains essentially parliamentary in the sense 
that the executive still maintains uh, a dual structure and the Council of Ministers politically responsibly before the legislature. This situation has caused never ending controversies about the office of the president. In my opinion, the constitution was actually left the destiny of the executive branch to the personality of the presidents. Uh, some of the presidents in this period have become more active and effective than other because of their uh, political identities. The constitution has been amended 19 times in 39 years and more than half of the constitution has been changed since then. And the amendments aim to abolish anti-democratic provisions uh, and in favor of adjustment for the European Union standardization program until 2007. In my opinion, in 2007, that everything is changed. The year, uh, the years 2007 and two, uh, 2008 eight, witnessed series of political and constitutional crisis and accordingly, couple of constitutional amendments. It is impossible to refer to those modifications as implemented solely for the sake of democratization. They were part of the political battle between political Islamists and the non-homogeneous, uh, the other side. Uh, in my opinion, the constitutional amendments, which were the, uh, on behalf of the ruling party, AKP, have begun in the year of uh, the 2000, 2007. In the winter of the 2007, the first constitutional crisis was triggered by the debates on the election of the president and resulted a very debatable constitutional court decision. I said debatable, but I think that um, it was terribly wrong decision of uh, in that time, uh, publicly known as the 367th decision. It was about the decisional quorum and if needed a special quorum requirement for the meeting of, uh, of the assembly and the, uh, at the end the court has invented a rule which doesn't exist in the constitution and re, uh, the related law. The wrong decision. Ojab, it's going perfectly well, but so that we can have some time for the Q&A as well. May I ask you, you know, just to focus on the 2017 over the next two or three minutes so that we can have okay. some time for the Q&A as well. I wouldn't like to interfere at all, sorry, but I'm mm -hmm. under time okay. pressure. <laughs> okay, just two minutes, okay, just two minutes. Sorry for that, of course, of course. I mean, you've got time yeah. to wrap it up. Okay. Uh, the wrong decision was the great opportunity for the IKP. They reacted uh, to the new situation by passing a constitutional amendment with the support of minor opposition party. The change involved the election by direct popular vote of the president. That was a dream of Turkish right-wing politicians and right-wing political parties from the 70s. The amendment uh, was submitted to the refer uh, referendum by outgoing president, uh, President Ahmed Nejda Cesar, and was approved uh, of uh, the October 2007 by approximately 70% uh, per uh, uh, of uh, majority. Uh, okay. Mm. Until 2007, the general direction of constitutional amendment were the partial democratization and liberalization of Turkish constitution and the political system. But after 2007, we have witnessed the AKP making a huge effort to real, uh, realize its political aims through constitutional amendments. amendments. So the last one, uh, the 2017 uh, amendments, uh, is the part of it, uh, actually. Uh, last amendments were adopted in 2017 and Turkey has threw away a century old parliamentary tradition by the referendum in this year. That was an unbelievable and devastating step by Turkish democracy. 
uh, Turkey had trying to remain loyal to principle of separation of powers for decades, despite all its historical misfortunes and the crisis endured, but the ruling party had always succeeded in presenting these goal-oriented amendments for its own interest is uh, in quite fancy democratization uh, package. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, I think that's uh, the, uh, the, that's enough. The last one, the last uh, last sentence, maybe uh, the trouble is not uh, when you look at all the history of the constitution of Turkey. Uh, trouble is not just the powers powers of the presidents in the text of the constitution. There are other uh, decisive factors which shapes the functionary such as political culture, uh, the structure of the political parties, the qualities of Turkish, the Turkish democracy, uh, and the religious and the, all the cultural elements, the social and economic, uh, the policies actually, you know, they're all affected uh, by what happened in, in Turkey. And uh, one more thing, the, the tradition, the very important for all systems, uh, for the parliamentary systems or the presidential systems, the traditions. The, the ruling party has destroyed all the traditions in the, the governmental system. This, this is the, the something horrible in Turkey happened, uh, the, I think. You know, the tradition, uh, the, the, the British, the parliamentary system or uh, the American, uh, the presidential system are so important. We had lots of traditions in our system, but they destroyed it. So. Uh, we came today. Yeah, I think I'll stop. Maybe some questions I'll try to answer. Thank you very much. I'm quite sure there will be questions. So, you know, just we are ending on a pessimistic note, and I will continue uh, without losing any minute with questions. I mean, we've got quite a few questions. I'm going to start.